The last session of, of the conference will be addressing the rather, you know, the, the small issue of the future of the financial services industry. Um, and um, we have one sort of surprise for you, which Michael Klein, who was with us this morning, um, had to had to leave at lunchtime. And so um, Noel Latif, very good friend of mine and president and CEO of the Foreign Policy Association, will be moderating this session. So Noel, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I've decided. Uh, is this on? No. Um, testing. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Can you hear me? No, not yet. <clears throat> is it open? Can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> I, I have a strong voice, so I'm going to uh, boom here. It's on. It's on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I am going to uh, avoid uh, making lengthy uh, opening remarks. Uh, and I thought uh, because uh, throughout the day we've been, um, we have not given you enough time for questions, we'd like to leave lots of time for questions. Can you hear me now? Uh, no. Uh, so, uh, and I sense that there are a lot of questions in the audience, uh, which reminds me of the uh, story about the British diplomat who was granted an audience by uh, Chairman Mao, and uh, he decided he was going to ask him a seminal question. So he uh, turned to uh, Chairman Mao and asked him how the world would have been different if uh, Khrushchev had been assassinated instead of John F. Kennedy. Uh, Chairman Mao stopped and thought about it for a moment uh, and uh, responded, we know one thing's for certain, um, Aristotle Onassis would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> <laughs> Our panel this afternoon is uh, charged with peering around the corner and uh, reimagining the future of financial services. We've heard at some length today that this is a defining moment uh, for the financial services industry. I've encouraged our panelists uh, to unburden themselves of what keeps them up at night uh, and to share with us policy recommendations to address their concerns uh, uh, to restore the uh, uh, long-term integrity of the financial system. We're going to uh, begin with Sir Derek Maughan, uh, who needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, Sir Derek is currently a partner at Kohlberg Kravis Roberts and chairs KKR Japan. Uh, Sir Derek. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It must be a very slow day for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you know Alan Bennett. He's a British man of letters. He wrote a play called The History Boys, in which a famous line appears that history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> Actually, he was somewhat more profane, but you get the idea. Uh, I lead the uh, financial services group at KKR, and I have to say, uh, the last year and a half has just been one damn thing after another. Uh, the lost weekends at Bear, at Lehman, at AIG, the uh, fraught conversations with Washington Mutual and Wachovia, and the continuing conversations with parties who've asked me not to name them. Uh, in our view, uh, this, is, this crisis is bigger and more pervasive uh, than any before. And I say that having started life in the British Treasury when in the 1970s uh, we had to apply to the IMF for a bailout. I say that having lived in Japan in the 1980s when the boom went burst. I say that uh, having guided Solomon Brothers through a near collapse and having served at City and been directly involved in the Latin American, Asian, Russian and other defaults. Uh, we passed the hat, as I recall, for John Merriweather, uh, but not for Boris Yeltsin. Uh, this is more profound, and its consequences will be, uh, I think, uh, historic. Big words. 
Now, what makes this crisis different? Well, some things are common. Human psychology, uh, intellectual arrogance, asymmetric incentives, and weak governance structures. Certainly every mistake that I've witnessed over the last four decades uh, showed all those characteristics. And some of them are hard to eradicate. It's possible people could become humble. Um, but what makes this different? Well, the scale of the losses, scale matters. The IMF estimates the losses in this credit cycle at $4 trillion. We've certainly not seen anything like that before, which pretty much wipes out the capital base of the entire banking system. Second thing, uh, the proliferation of highly structured, leveraged financial products with little or no capital to back them up and little or no understanding of how those products might behave going forward. Third, uh, this crisis has triggered, unlike any of the previous crises, a global recession with a collapse in industrial production and a sharp contraction in world trade. Uh, and fourth, as you've probably heard, I'm sorry I couldn't join you earlier, uh, the political response that this crisis has called forth, with governments everywhere compelled to inject bank equity, guarantee bank debt, take bad assets, and ring fence others. Here in America, we have, correctly in my view, undertaken massive, quite unprecedented, and ultimately unsustainable fiscal and monetary stimuli, hoping to stem the economic collapse while we shore up the banks and get credit flowing. It's a race against time. And the consequences. We can, also, we can already begin to discern certain consequences of this crisis. The first is, regrettably to this audience, that US leadership on global economic and financial policy has been substantially diminished. For all of my life, the Americans took the lead in terms of power, but also persuasion in making the key appointments and making the big calls. Uh, our moral authority is not what it was, and the evidence is not in our favor. And I do not believe the Europeans or the Asians are listening particularly closely to what we have to say. Second, the global economic recovery will be muted. That's the way it is with balance sheet recessions. It is going to take us some years to work our way through the leverage that was accumulated over the last 20 years. It follows, third, that future growth will come from productivity gains, not leverage. And, in our view, the cost of capital will rise throughout the economy both for households and corporations. Just to give you an idea of what's at issue here, bank debt, uh, the, the degree to which banks levered themselves in order to lend. Bank debt went from $5.3 trillion in 1997 to $17.2 trillion last year. That is from 64% to 121 percent of GDP. We don't know whether the 17 backs down to 12 or 10. If it goes all the way back to 5, uh, that's a real issue. And it will certainly put a lid on asset prices. 
Fifth, uh, a sharp correction in global trade and capital flows is already taking place. We could discuss this further if you wish, but it's likely to put pressure on the dollar. Our government is due, our government is due to issue 2.75 trillion of debt this year. With the Japanese trade surplus having evaporated, and China redirecting its resources to domestic demand. So the supply of government bonds is up, the available resources are down, the price can adjust in, in one of two ways, or both, raise the interest rate, or drop the dollar. We will have, beyond all this, a major challenge in navigating the medium-term transition to long-term fiscal sustainability and reeling back the quite extraordinary expansion in the monetary base. For the financial services industry, uh, the IMF, as I mentioned, estimates that banks globally will lose about $4 trillion, of which only about a third has been recognized to date. We're often asked, you know, are we halfway through the movie? What innings are we in? Um, that's difficult for an Englishman, there are only two. So I guess <laughs> we're still in the first innings. Uh, but in the US, uh, the losses in the next two years, and you can see now I'm beginning to focus on the stress test and the capital that the banks will have to put up, numbers to be declared a week from today. The losses are put at 550 billion, with over time an additional equity requirement of 275 billion. If you look, that's for the system, if you look at the stress test itself, it was applied to 19 institutions, of which 12 are banks. The market currently is guessing that the equity requirement for those 12 banks might be 50 to 70 billion, and that eight or nine of the banks will require additional capital. Where is that capital coming from? Is something that Gary can answer for you. <laughs> I'd like you to donate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say, for all of the criticism, the, prof the stem the story, the stress test does seem to me to be thorough and a quite professional assessment. And what really matters is, at what capital standard would we judge the system to be safe and sound? One thing seems clear, though, uh, which is that we will have significant public shareholdings in our banks for the foreseeable future. 542 institutions have received TARP so far. We tend to focus on the familiar 10 or 12. 542. And if the TARP already supplied to the top 10 banks in America were to be converted into common, we, the voting public, would have a 27% voting share in those banks. This raises to me some quite complex questions of both goals and governance. I commend to you a short piece in the Wall Street Journal last Friday by Robert Reich, who asks, are, are the goals of these government-owned banks to maximize social welfare, extend credit, lower interest rates, grant access, support industries, or is it to maximize profits and how will accountability be exercised if trustees are appointed who are neither accountable to the Secretary of Treasury nor to shareholders? I don't have answers, but these are questions that we need to answer if we're to attract private capital and if banks are to begin to function in the ways that we expect. The only other thought I'd make uh, for now would be this. It's not all about the banks. 
If you were to look at loans extended in the American economy today, only 45% come from banks. 55% come from the non-banks, or pejoratively, the shadow banks. Nothing good happens in a shadow. But there are 14 trillion of assets that currently have no natural funding base because of the capital markets and the securitization process shut down. And a good many of those companies, which are familiar to you, credit card companies, leasing companies, consumer finance companies, car loans, and so on, are in what I would call orderly runoff. Now, it's true the Fed has stepped into the breach and extended $2 trillion, uh, but that's still 12 to go. All offers welcome. But propping up the banks is one thing, but it could be more than offset by contraction in the non-bank lending institutions until such time as we can get confidence re-established in structured and securitized bonds. I will leave it at that. It's not as bleak as it sounds. <laughs> uh, prices are incredibly low. And if we can figure out these balance sheets, uh, there's some terrific deals to be done. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Derek, for that sobering assessment. Uh, and now we're going to turn to uh, Magnus uh, Boker, who is the president of the NASDAQ OMEX group. Hopefully he'll be a little more upbeat. I'd take the same position here. I don't know whether that makes it more. Could I be more uh, sober, more um, whatever I say will probably sound pretty uh, optimistic. Uh, but still, uh, one damn thing after another, uh, to quote Derek. Uh, I, I can't resist, Derek, even though I didn't think to start there. Have you had such a fun things going on? I mean, you talk about what did you do in the 70s? What did you do in the 80s? What did you do in the 90s? And now you're here, and you still smile. There have got to be a few good things in between. Uh, I think there is um, my remarks. This is starting a remark here is that, uh, unfortunately, I will not give such a upbeat uh, message either, even though there is a few lessons learned over the last two years that I like to share. And therefore, I also think within those lessons learned, there might be a few things that will take us forward. And I'd like to um, continue with what Derek said, and there's nothing good that happens in the shadows. And I think one of the uh, most important things for where we come from over the last year is the importance of transparency and trust. The importance of whatever financial markets do happens in transparency, in the light of understanding, and therefore creates trust. I'm very honored to uh, represent the exchanges here, the stock exchanges or the derivatives or uh, exchanges or commodity exchanges. There is no doubt that lessons learned over the last two years is that the business model of exchanges is a fantastic business model. Never during these two years or year and a half of crisis have we be, been dysfunctional. We've been open every day, we've been trading, we've had phenomenal good liquidity in the market. You might not always like th the prices, but you can be trading every day. Every company being listed, every company that's on our markets, whether it's here or another market, have been able to issue capital. Meanwhile, these companies will not be able to go to the credit market. Most of the problems we've seen over the last t the recession, the crisis, is the lack of function, the lack of transparency and trust in the credit market. Whether we call them seed credit default swaps or whether we call them different kind of different names, but they are traded OTC, they are traded outside the public domain of control, transparency of price, and therefore also the trust what's behind them. There is no doubt that some of the f defaulting banks we've seen have been leveraging those products far more than they were able to take care of it. 
So my first reflection about the lessons learned is that the exchange business model turned out to be a very good business model. It's a business model of 200 years and it will therefore, I think, be the business model for the future for very much of taking care of the risk to take care of how to distribute risk among investors and companies. The second observation in my lessons learned is technology. There is no doubt that the importance of technology, how we've been able to adopt technology to uh, create information, how we uh, today know what's going on all over the world, how we use technology to uh, take care of that, how technology today is used as an important tool to reduce the friction cost, the cost of transporting risk. I think therefore technology and the use of technology will be an even more important thing going forward. The third one, and, and still this is in the context, I'm trying to break off Derek's a little bit more dampened um, view of the future. We're still here to talk about whether there is a future. This, the third or my lessons learned is services. There is no doubt that we as financial services organization, whether we are investment banks, whether we are banks, whether we are exchanges or any other players in this one, we need to think more of what's the value to our customers, the service organization. I think we have lost that. We lost the customer. Um, I feel greatly today among many of the bank CEOs and what they do and what they put their time on, but I think they meet very few customers at the moment. I think that many of the uh, customers out there is thinking about to whom are they customers and I think that who are the one carrying forward services going forward will be extremely important. My fourth lesson, my fourth remarks is according to regulatory. Uh, I know that you've been talking about it earlier today, I think there is no reason to get into too further but I think we will see regulatory things in two aspects. I think the importance of and the risk of regulatory change that will have negative effect to uh, first maybe the financial industry but that will naturally spread to be negative to the economy is at risk. I'm very afraid that we will have more regulatory things coming in creating more problems than it actually trying to solve. There's no doubt that we need new regulatory regime but we don't need more regulatory issues right now. We, write, we need the right regulatory schemes and I think that's extremely important. We don't need more, we need the right ones. I think there will be certain countries in the world that will be much faster to adopt more modern regulatory regimes. Countries that have a lot of trust and I think those countries will have a, an advantage towards other custom, countries. I think that's a risk from a U.S. perspective that other countries suddenly becomes far more attractive to do business in than the U.S. and suddenly companies start moving. In the world of where we are today, companies are very easy to move their business uh, much faster than we used to be and I think we'll follow that. So we see the uh, risk of regulatory things will therefore be very strongly focused one way where will the right regulatory regimes be that is trusted, transparent and create the right environment for companies and a regulatory regime that also creates innovation. I think one of the things we have uh, learned is that we learned that the bad things about certain products, certain issues about future products or CDSs, don't blame the products. Since I'm a Swede, it's very easy to blame Alfred Nobel for the dynamite because people, you could easily get hurt if you use it the wrong way. But still, it's a wonderful innovation. And I think when it comes to financial world going forward, the financial services sector, the importance of product innovation is extremely important. And we could make a lot of things coming out of that innovation world, but we need to have transparency. We need to see what it causes, what it needs for. But I think that's the the fourth, the second thing out of the regulatory. So my starting remark is very much into transparency and trust, open markets, transparent markets, which I think exchanges or exchange-like entities could give. The second one is technology, adopting technology, developing technology in order to create more efficient, less friction in any market, so you get capital where capital should be. 
th the third one is how do we get service to the clients? Who is actually the clients out there and how could we get the service to them so we service them and not ourselves as financial organizations? And the fourth one is the regulatory piece. How do we get right regulatory? Where in the world will the right regulatory with the right trust and transparency be in order to continue to develop? So that would be my four starting points. I think, therefore, when I listen to uh, our 4,000 listed companies, when I look into the, uh, the backlog of IPOs, I'm maybe a little bit more op optimistic. I think most of our companies we talk to start to have their hands around the problems. I think that's a pretty good start. They see where they are, they see the problems, they are far from through it, but at least they are much more focused on the effects right now. The IPOs and the IPO market, um, given that we are not seeing any huge changes from where we are today, uh, we have approximately 160 IPOs in the queue right now and they're spending a lot of money to keep that updated. Not all of them will come to the market. It wouldn't surprise me if we, within a year, four quarters from now, will have a little bit different IPO markets and interest to uh, companies to come to the market. That will be my little upbeat end to it. No. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Magnus. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Annette Nazareth, uh, a member of the uh, Financial Institutions Group uh, at Davis Polk and Wardwell and a former SEC commissioner. Thank you. I think it's fair to say that uh, my perspective and remarks um, are certainly colored by my personal experience as a uh, securities regulator uh, of the last decade, uh, having retired from the SEC uh, just a year ago, and also as uh, a nine-year member of the Financial Stability Forum, which will now be the Financial Stability Board. And I have to say that um, I come, therefore, with a great respect and admiration for the power of regulation, but also uh, with some concerns about its limitations and the expectations that we all seem to have, uh, given that we all, all have views on what the lessons are that we've learned, and therefore we're, we seem to have the optimism that uh, we won't make these mistakes again. And I certainly hope that's true, but um, I'm not quite sure I, I uh, believe that will be the case. Um, my perspective on lessons learned, I thought I would share with you uh, a few things. Um, one is that, and others have mentioned this as well, we really do have to focus on better corporate governance. Corporate governance is something that the SEC, you know, was sort of, I always felt was being talked about and indeed fought about uh, in our society as a very academic matter. And I think that the recent experience has shown that corporate governance is more than an academic matter. Uh, the colossal failures that we saw in a number of the major financial institutions, I think, really is, um, uh, does show that we need much stronger boards who are much more focused on the risks uh, and the businesses of the, of the firms that they oversee. Uh, they need to be much more aggressive in ensuring that incentives are aligned within their organizations to ensure that um, the risks that are undertaken are not disproportionate with the, with the rewards. Um, certainly all the talk that we've heard about with respect to executive compensation is entirely appropriate. Uh, executive compensation was uh, really quite out of whack in, uh, and we can sort of say that freely now at, uh, and uh, without being viewed as uh, anti-free uh, market. Uh, the, um, the risks that uh, that executives took in order to ensure that they um, got much higher compensation was not in the best interests of shareholders and that's something that I think we need to focus on more uh, going forward. Um, I think even issues such as say on pay which have not been particularly popular in this country but have been adopted in other jurisdictions, I, I guess my own view is I don't understand why we're afraid of that. I mean having some sort of check on uh, executive compensation and frankly on um, board issues in general, even with greater access to the proxy, is something that we should uh, seriously consider in light of uh, you know, our recent experience. Um, I think recent experience also shows that risk management was uh, nowhere near as robust as uh, we might have thought. 
Um, certainly, um, I think there were a lot of improvements in risk models, but our faith in those models, I think, uh, exceeded uh, the, ju the justifications for that faith. Um, risk, risk management techniques, I think, had improved, but not to the extent that we uh, relied on them. Um, certainly what, what we found even at the commission was that um, the, the disregard for tail risk I think was quite troubling that you know at some point you can sort of reverse engineer the risk models to, um, to you know, give the result that you want and that's, uh, that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, we, there was a little bit of mention earlier about um, you know, uh, credit default swaps and, and the risks that were inherent in those. I mean, there were many, many products, obviously, that were highly levered products that, uh, uh, you know, the, the risks of which and the, uh, the need to uh, provision against were, were not uh, fully comprehended. Um, I have to say what we found at the Commission was really quite startling. When we uh, first saw the problems in the uh, credit default swap market and in, in the ABS market, we uh, went into the firms and, and looked at, um, you know, how they were valuing these positions. And, and what we found was, particularly with respect to ABS, that, um, that the firms were, in many cases, not tracking how the underlying assets in those securitized products were performing. Um, a lot of those uh, assets, uh, I know in the banks and in some of the investment banks were in special purpose vehicles. They were sort of out of sight, out of mind. And there was a almost blind uh, uh, faith in the credit ratings that, uh, that those products had. And, and therefore, the, the, um, the markdowns on those positions were non-existent. They were being held at par, which was really quite astonishing given that under the capital rules and uh, under Basel as well, if these positions were in the trading book, which they should have been, they should have been marked to market and there should have been more rigorous analysis. Indeed, what we found at some places was when we went in and we asked them to, to value on their own and to not have, uh, you know, blind, uh, uh, you know, faith in the uh, credit ratings, there was a sort of flurry as, as these firms had to go and actually gather the data to figure out what the underlying assets were, which is uh, quite astonishing given that we all thought the risk management was uh, far more robust than that. So um, that obviously has been a real lesson. We need a lot better risk management at the firms and a lot more rigorous assessment. And, and certainly another lesson in that regard is that a lot of the, um, at least at some of the firms, it, it turns out that risk management didn't report into the to the uh, to the right in the right way that they were reporting in some cases to business lines as opposed to independent areas of the firm. Obviously, that's a highly dangerous situation and something that uh, um, is fraught with conflict. Um, another lesson, obviously, that we've all learned is that capital matters a lot, uh, and that there were also um, uh, you know some limitations on capital measures. Some uh, again, sense that we could have done a better job of measuring capital. Cushions are much more important than, uh, uh, than perhaps was um, uh, given credence to. I, I have to say my experience with the Consolidated Supervised Entity Program was that, um, you know, the, the brokerage firms uh, were actually not happy with the SEC, that the SEC did not let the firms rely solely on value at risk modeling uh, in, in valuing their uh, positions for capital purposes because we did not have sufficient faith in those models. Um, and uh, the firms, you know, fought, fought back very hard on that and in fact were arguing, well, if you don't agree with VAR, given how scientific this all is, if you're, you know, so in the, in the dark about this, well, we'll triple it. We're willing to triple the capital charge um, that, that results from these analyses. And of course, our response was three times zero is still zero. Uh, no, uh, in fact, we're going to put much higher um, plugs uh, onto, the, uh, onto the calculations. And so I think, again, um, there's much to be learned about how we need to um, look back on, the, on um, you know, the capital regime. I think, in general, um, you know, Basel had much to say for it, and I, I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, throw it out by any stretch. I think there's uh, m many, many good things about it, but I think we have a better uh, recognition now that um, things happen, that there are things we don't know, 
that the um, the capital uh, formulations themselves assume that you understand the risk as you are sort of working your way through those uh, those models. And if you don't understand the risk, which is what happened here, we didn't understand the risk of some of these products to the tune of trillions of dollars. Um, you can be way off, and whatever you thought was sufficient capital is grossly insufficient, and. Uh, and that was a very unfortunate lesson. Another lesson was that leverage really did matter. Um, at the commission, we had uh, a lot of focus on liquidity. There was never uh, a leverage test for investment banks. Investment banks, by definition, were levered entities. Um, and so, um, but there was, a, again, a lot of focus on capital and on um, uh, and on liquidity. But what we found with uh, Bayer uh, and others was that uh, there, were, there were more issues involved. With Bayer Stearns, what we saw was that the, uh, the funding sources completely dried up. One, one thing that was not um, comprehended in, in the SEC's uh, model was the notion that for an investment bank and for all of these banks that relied on overnight funding, that literally you could have a situation not where you had a 10 percent haircut uh, in funding your overnight treasuries, which was the absolute worst case, unimaginable uh, situation that the, the SEC had modeled for, but that basically you'd have a 100 percent haircut, that at some point the marketplace would decide they simply didn't want to deal with you. There had been a complete uh, loss of confidence in the institution. and. Um, so that is a, a big lesson. I think thus, uh, you know, all the investment banks decided uh, that they essentially could not survive without access to the Fed window because um, uh, if you have a situation where your funding sources can completely dry up on the overnight uh, uh, window, then you must have uh, access to the Fed. Um, ultimately, what this has uh, brought us to is a, a recognition that uh, in general, we do need a, a better regulatory framework, and others have, have referred to that. I think there's lots of opportunity to improve and to streamline our regulatory uh, processes. Um, I think uh, I would agree it's not necessarily more regulation that we need, but much smarter regulation, more thoughtful, more streamlined, but in some cases more uh, severe, I suppose, and, and uh, more prescriptive regulation uh, than uh, perhaps was talked about in the last couple of years when all we talked about was prudential regulation, light touch, and the um, uh, beauty of the uh, free markets. And ultimately, I think there's also a recognition that we really do need some sort of systemic risk regulator. Um, it is interesting to me, having been on the Financial Stability Forum, that there's almost nothing that occurred that had not come up in some conversation, in some dialogue over the last several years. There was talk of different, um, you know, different trends that we were seeing. But taking all of those little trends and those little factoids and connecting the dots to bring us to where we are today was almost inconceivable. And we have to hope, and I hope this will be the case, that if we have a systemic risk regulator, if we have a bit more concentration of the view, uh, the 30,000 foot view, uh, by some uh, regulator who's looking at all of these um, activities together, uh, that there will be a better sense of, um, of where the really big risks are and that we can try to address them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Annette. I, uh, in this gloomy time, I was, and particularly after lunch, I mean, who wants to hear from a former regulator, right? So I was going to tell a joke, but I thought better of it because uh, when I'd been controller of the currency, my first um, speaking event was before the American Bankers Association. It used to be that they had 10,000 people, some fancy resort. Now it'll be bread and water probably somewhere on Lexington Avenue, but in those days it was a big event. And they had the big screens and they projected your uh, visage on the screens and it was, you spoke, the first thing I said was I'm going to tell a joke. I told a joke, gave my regulator speech. I did the same thing at the second event, another big event, then another third event. Uh, uh, and just as I said at the third event, same kind of format, I want to tell you today uh, my joke. Somebody in the back of the room where that gentleman's standing jumped up and he went, <laughs> which I took to be a signal that they did not want to hear the joke. So I, um, 
I didn't tell it. And uh, as I was walking out of the uh, the venue, uh, I bumped into the fellow who'd made these hand motions, and it turned out it was one of my employees at the OCC. <laughs> so uh, he said, before I could get out a word, he said, put his arm around me, he said, you don't understand as uh, controller of the currency, you meet every day with the chairman of the Fed and the secretary of the Treasury and discuss important matters. You're far too important to tell jokes at uh, venues like this. So I, I, I bought it, uh, of course, like any sort of um, new government official. Uh, then at the end of my term, after five years, it's a five-year term for controllers, uh, the, um, they have a silly old uh, ceremony where they unveil a portrait they painted of you. Mine, I think, today is hanging in the garage of the OCC, if you'd like to see it, a very handsome portrait in the garage. And um, so uh, uh, it's one of the few times in government where they serve alcoholic beverages. Uh, they unveil the portrait, and after a few uh, drinks, this fellow, same fellow who had made the hand motions, said how important I was, came up to me and he put his arm around me, and he said, you know, he said, do you remember the time I told you how important you were? And I said, yeah. He said, wasn't true. You just tell jokes so badly. <laughs> so that's it for jokes, uh, even in a uh, even in a uh, difficult time. Um, I want to cover seven points today, uh, and I, I commend uh, the uh, formulators of this panel for focusing on the future because I really think that we are at a stage in the crisis where the issue so uh, is not so much coming up with new ideas as it is simply executing on the ideas we have, and um, I, I think we can't uh, understate um, what a magnificent job uh, regulators around the world, financial institutions uh, have done in responding to the regulators uh, uh, in this very difficult time. I mean, people at the New York Fed were literally sleeping there uh, uh, all night and working into the weekends every weekend. Uh, so a terrific job. We've now set our course uh, in the new administration. I think the course is a sensible one. And the issue before the House, it seems to me, in building trust is not change in ideas. It's execute, execute, execute. I mean, whether the ideas are perfect or not perfect, it doesn't matter so much that we execute execute on the ideas and execute on them well. A uh, second point is that, uh, of course, uh, we are in a re-regulatory environment. And uh, that can take uh, many directions. One thing is certain. And unfortunately, it will be the case over the next two years that the regulators will get tougher and tougher and tougher. The dynamic of a cycle for a, a financial services regulator is something on the order of press interest, congressional interest, you're called up for past mistakes, and the several thousand employees you have out in the field who have been doing their job day to day are uh, are affected by that kind of uh, intense interest and they become tougher and tougher and tougher. And that is going to happen over the rest of the cycle. Second thing, of course, is that we are in fact going to have significant re-regulation on a global basis in a new format. Uh, I think it's likely there will be a systemic risk regulator or regulatory body or something, but uh, it, it, while I think the actual form of what we do is up in the air. The fact that we're going to do something eventually, I think, is is clear. It, it may well be less uh, robust than is uh, brooded about in the press, but it will be significant. Third, I think the, the big issue is not first how do we regulate. I think this is a terrible mistake. It is what kind of financial system do we want to have. The, the financial system, what kind of financial services made available by whom, seems to me to be the lead question. And then you figure out what the regulation is, not how do we regulate, and then, oh, what's the financial system going to do for the well-being of the United States or the globe? In that regard, I see two serious dangers. One is that we're going to have very large public utilities that used to be vigorous banking organizations. I, I think that would be tragic. I think there is a huge danger of that, that we get into a, a mode where we have overcapitalized, uh, overregulated public utilities that are no longer vibrant and innovative. But it is, I think it's a genuine danger. Second danger is exactly at the other end of the barbell that we forget about the community banking sector of the United States, which is one of the things that makes the United States so very um, uh, exciting. Uh, we, uh, we, the community banks around America, over 8,000 of them, have provided a lot of the innovative 
capital uh, to start up enterprises. And in this environment, there's a very great danger that um, uh, we'll um, lose that sector. We're, we're certainly going to see uh, hundreds of additional banks fail uh, or be resolved, and what we do with the sector is important. Um, uh, point number five I wanted to make is that um, uh, our, the biggest danger we face beyond what we do with the, with the financial sector is that we as a nation, and particularly in the area of finance, lose our nerve. That we certainly have had a hiccup, uh, you know, serious, traumatic, worse since the Great Depression. But um, it really is a result of innovation and technology, the two major forces of our time, technology and globalization coming together. And, 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 and an, uh, an innovation that's resulted in efficiencies in the financial sector that, lest we forget, uh, these innovations have really driven the world to a greater degree of prosperity than anybody has seen uh, in, in history, not just a thousand years in history. And we, we are in tremendous danger of losing our nerve. If we lose our nerve, we, we'll uh, subject ourselves not just to a lost decade, but, but to many lost decades. So we, we can't lose the innovative spirit. Uh, 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 point number six, I, I, I would bet on America. At the end of the day, as bad as this is, this still is a nation of innovators. Uh, I agree with uh, what uh, uh, Sir Derek just said. Uh, without question, we have um, clearly uh, taken a hit to our prestige. I gave a talk at the International Conference of Bank Supervisors. It's a, it's a lecture one gives every two years. It's a distinguished thing to do. Uh, 139 different countries and, a, and the hostility towards America. I, I hope it wasn't my speech, <laughs> though could have been. But I think it was the hostility towards the country and what we put the world through in terms of this crisis was certainly palpable. But at the same time, uh, I, would, I would bet on America. And I would also bet that the innovation will not be stifled for long. And the reason for that is that, in fact, the drivers have, have been uh, uh, world forces, forces that have not been just the imagination of people on Wall Street making money. It's easy to find scapegoats. But in fact, it's been, been innovative forces, technology and technology leading to a greater degree of globalization, which have, uh, which have caused the, the uh, developments we've seen and I think will drive the developments of the future, frankly, whether we, we like it or not. So with that said, I'm looking forward to questions. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Gene. Uh, our last panelist is Gary Parr. Gary is a veteran uh, investment banker and uh, is currently deputy chairman of Lazar. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. It's a privilege to be here. I'm, I'm a basketball fan, and it just occurred to me just now as I was walking the, uh, if you know the basketball team, particularly college basketball. So what's just happened is I've been sitting on the bench while the team has been playing a great game. And there's about, if I look at the clock correctly, about 30 seconds left to go. And we're up by 20 points. And the coach has just allowed me to go on the, on the court. So I kind of know what I'm supposed to do. Um, let me make a few quick points. Rather than uh, replicate, I'll just build on and be maybe very specific on some forecasts short term. There will be more losses in financial institutions, hundreds of billions of dollars over the course of the next 6 to 18 months. Uh, that's on a global basis, indeed, in the U.S. Uh, my guess is it will be a couple of hundred billion at least. So echoing uh, Derek. Um, given that's the case, there will be a need to raise substantial common equity, hundreds of billions of dollars likely. Some portion of that will be earned by earnings. I'll take an aside. The banking business today, if you have a deposit base, is incredibly profitable on the margin. The new business, so if someone is clean and have dealt with their past, the banking business is incredibly profitable. The problem is dealing with the past. So as to opportunities, look for the institutions that indeed have dealt with their past. The incremental marginal new business these days is very profitable. Uh, but, but having said that, for many big institutions, the profits that they are deriving from their business today will not be enough to fill the hole of the incremental losses. They will have to raise substantial common. The primary provider of common over the last six months, and on a global basis, have been governments. 
I, I expect that to continue, that the provi primary provider, so in a sense, I wasn't joking when I said to Derek, when he said I'd know where to go look for the money, it's you. <laughs> and so, and you, and you, uh, we as taxpayers will continue to contribute because the private capital markets haven't come back in size to deal with this issue yet. Um, there will be opportunities, it's not zero. We had the pleasure of advising Mitsubishi investing $9 billion into Morgan Stanley. Uh, there is money available for particular transactions, but not enough to deal with the systemic issues. So with losses more common to be raised, uh, it becomes fairly easy to predict that it will be government activity. It will likely come also in the form of conversion from preferred into common. Expect to see some big numbers uh, of those conversions. It's the easiest way, if you don't want to write an additional check, it's the easiest way to deal with a balance sheet issue and push money, uh, capital into a lower capital, that being common equity, tangible common equity, which is the shortage today due to the losses. Um, I, it's fairly easy to predict as well, given the nature of things we're working on, there will be a fair number of continuing bankruptcies of financial institutions. Um, I will draw a line and say I don't think it'll be amongst the big 19. Uh, the government has effectively said they don't wish for any of those to go bankrupt in a Lehman-esque manner. There may be orchestrated transactions and mergers. There may be events that deal with institutions, but uh, I do not expect to see a lehman -esque type bankruptcy of a big institution. I do expect to see a fair number in mid-sized financial institutions that for one reason or another have difficulties uh, and do not pose systemic risk. The easiest way to predict whether someone will be allowed to go bankrupt, I think, is whether the government believes they believe that they pose systemic risk. Uh, if not, they can go. Um, in the intermediate term, a few um, quick things is to, again, forecast or views about the industry. One is, in a sense, I'm hopeful that th there will be more regulation, and I am really hopeful that it will target risk, that there will be a lot more regulation around risk, different risk metrics, ways to measure risk, not only capital but liquidity, in a variety of forms. That would be good regulation. Uh, the dangerous type of regulation would be, for example, a number of people discuss sometimes, w was, did all of this arise due to Glass-Steagall going away? My answer would be definitively no. The core part of Glass-Steagall had to do with separation of investment banks, uh, business, securities business, and banks. And I would hold out as um, evidence Washington Mutual and Wachovia, two of the biggest wipeouts uh, in the last uh, year, both they went down due to a banking business. Didn't have to do with the securities business per se. Obviously, Lehman and Bear Stearns went uh, due to securities risks, but it wasn't because they were in both. It wasn't, didn't have to do with the, the core Glass-Steagall principle. So with that, I hope we won't go that route because I think it's unnecessary. I do think a lot of uh, regulation of risk. One last uh, way in looking at uh, forecast, uh, it is likely we come out of this with between five and ten major global financial institutions that are full service providers. Those entities are necessary. The way the markets work, the way the capital markets have now evolved to where we are today, there is a need for institutions that can source capital on a global basis when the markets come back. Uh, th so some number five to ten. It takes a lot to be a winner on a global scale. Not, so not a lot of people can get there, and there'll be an interesting process over the next three to five years of sorting out winners and losers, who can be the global players and providers of capital. On the other hand, there will be a number of specialty firms uh, in providing services. Um, many times people, I'm flattered many times people will talk about firms like a Lazard and say, yes, there's a place for the niche firms. We, we, we believe there is. But there'll be other types of specialty firms as well, so not just merger or strategic advisors. There will be risk takers. And so I would, be, would, I would guess we will see some number of very interesting institutions exist between three and seven years from now that will be the next generation of hedge funds, they won't be necessarily or just in the asset management business, but they will be in the trading and risk-taking business, and they will look a lot like proprietary trading desks. Um, th therefore, there ought to be some regulation, uh, uh, so we'll come back to regulation of risk, as I said there should be. But there'll be a lot of institutions that preferably should be private, because they can therefore deal with volatility better. 
uh, meaning they can afford to have volatility yet manage their risk profile such that they're not worried about a stock price or evaporation of their access to the capital markets from an equity point of view. So that's an interesting as innovation. Look for specialty firms providing a variety of specialties and growing up very fast. Great opportunities for some number of those providers. And lastly, the a bit of advice to um, governments. Much of the last 18 months was extremely well done by governments around the world dealing with situations that they hadn't anticipated and therefore in many countries, including the U.S., many of the decisions were made ad hoc. They had to be. What do you do when you've got Bear Stearns? You, you, literally, we had, you know, I was advising Bear Stearns, we had from Thursday night until Sunday night to figure out a solution. Then you roll into other circumstances where it's measured in days. What do you do? It becomes ad hoc. Things are not as bad today as they were last year at various points in time, notably September. We're not in a crisis mode. We're not spending as much time with a three-day shot clock to reach solutions. So the major lesson learned was ad hoc works when you're in trouble, but it creates precedents uh, where it will scare away private capital. Sitting today, if you don't know as an investor in any large financial institution that may need more capital, if you don't know whether the government will do an AIG or do a Lehman or do a Citigroup third recapitalization, each one of these treated the common shareholders very differently. And if you don't know how the government's going to come at you, it's, I think, speculative to say the least to buy the common stock because you just don't know. So I think we're in a great place for government to have uh, additional systemic solutions, plans where people can understand if this, then that, and then this. Once you know a roadmap, then you can raise capital from third parties from places other than government. That's being worked on, and I look forward to it being rolled out over the next couple of months, as, um, as particularly in the U.S. I'll stop there. Let us get to Q&A.